Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there. There were a number of uh, family emergencies that arose to prevent me from coming to Boston. I uh, have been reading the, the papers and, and, of course, very much interested in the uh, topic that of autonomous te technologies. Uh, I would simply note that it uh, is a topic that is among the uh, oldest in, in world culture and also, uh, to some extent, the first item on the news of the day every day uh, in 2017. Uh, looking back over uh, world culture and world literature, we have the, the story, myth, uh, the Greek myth of Pygmalion and Galatea. The story of a man who had uh, severe doubts about his relationship to women and therefore created a special feminine uh, statue that he fell in love with and through the um, intervention of the gods she was brought to life and uh, he lived uh, uh, happily ever after. Uh, in uh, another Greek myth, the, the story of the statues of Daedalus, uh, the mythical character who created these uh, creatures of stone that came to life and then would the problem is that they would wander off and wanted to do, wanted to do things in their own. Both uh, Plato and Aristotle make reference to this in various ways. In Aristotle it's uh, part of an argument that for free men, participants in the, in the city-state, uh, the only uh, reason why they would not need slaves to relieve them of life's everyday burdens uh, would be as if um, the statues of Daedalus in the, in the ancient myth were to become a reality and therefore they could have people uh, working for them. And there are a number, number of other stories. The um, uh, Jewish uh, folk tale about the golem. Uh, there are a number of other uh, s stories about making an artificial thing that comes to life and then uh, provides certain kinds of opportunities or perhaps problems. And of course the, the great story of this genre was written by uh, young Mary Shelley about 200 years ago, uh, the book Frankenstein, a modern Prometheus. And actually, I've always found this story very, very interesting because in the novel, um, at the uh, climactic moment, uh, uh, Victor Frankenstein and his creature meet a high in the Alps and have a kind of dialogues, dialogue about the responsibilities of the, uh, of the creator. Interestingly enough, if you look at uh, the adaptations of the wonderful novel, in 19th century theater productions, later theater productions, and throughout essentially the whole period of uh, 20th century cinematic uh, <clears throat> productions of, of the Frankenstein story, the creature loses his voice. So remember in the, in the novel, Mary Shelley's novel, the creature speaks, makes an argument, reminds Victor what his, uh, his responsibilities are. But in stage productions and then later in the movies, the creature is there kind of as a looming, murderous presence who makes uh, frightening noises but really has nothing to say. Now in the last 30 years or so, that has changed in television productions uh, and uh, in um, uh, movies and so forth where you have Frankenstein's creature beginning to talk and engage with his, his creator. Uh, the other thing I, I would like to say is that as regards uh, today's um, interest in things like artificial intelligence and robots, uh, there's one report after another, as you know, almost weekly that comes out with a new study about how maybe half or uh, more of the, of the workforce in the next two or three decades, decades will lose employment because smart machines will be able to take their both the kinds of physical factory jobs and also the kind of, uh, of in intellectual work in insurance, in law, and, uh, and so forth. So this is, this is a, uh, a common uh, theme in today's news. Uh, just this week, uh, also we've seen the uh, statement by a number of um, AI luminaries, including Elon Musk, uh, warning the, the world that releasing autonomous killer robots 
uh, into, uh, into the world might not be a good idea and perhaps we ought to, to, uh, to ban this uh, altogether. Uh, so these are among the, uh, the news stories that have caught my attention. One more that I will mention before you, you go to work today on this panel. It takes me back to a story of a, uh, an AI um, pioneer that I knew personally, uh, Joseph Weizenbaum, who created a program called ELIZA, also known as the Doctor Program. We'd sit at a keyboard and you would engage with this program. Uh, and it would uh, seem to do uh, psychotherapy. It was basically a, um, a, a program uh, predicated on the work of the uh, therapist uh, Carl Rogers, who had in humanistic psychology mode a kind of non-directive therapy. So the therapy sitting in a room would essentially feed back to the person who needed the therapy uh, certain kinds of uh, responses and the idea was that within the person themselves, if you just engaged them in a kind of non-directive way, they would find out uh, what their problems were and, and uh, solve them. Uh, Joe Weizenbaum's great horror was, of course, that the, when this thing got out into the world, people began using his uh, AI uh, algorithm um, and interaction with the machine to try to do therapy. His own secretary in the office, for example, became kind of addicted to, to uh, talking to the ELISA program and um, <clears throat> getting help for whatever problems she happened to have. And at that point, Weizenbaum himself became a kind of critic of, intellectual and social critic of, autonomous technologies in that mode, and he spent much of the rest of, the, of his career trying to sort of perhaps reclaim this uh, uh, device that he had uh, released into the, to the world. Now I mention this, that it's, it's again in today's news. Uh, a couple of days ago I was listening to the uh, BBC, and one of the uh, reports uh, on, the, on the air was that of the increasing use of therapy apps on your um, on your smartphone and uh, you sort of d dial up and you uh, download the, the app and it gives you uh, a chance to engage with uh, your smartphone and the app running on the, uh, on the machine as a way to uh, have counseling and therapy and advice on, on what, whatever it is that troubles you. And the thing that I found especially interesting in the BBC report is they went out and talked to people who had developed these apps or people who were in the um, uh, psychotherapy business. And what they concluded was that the apps were, if not at least as good, then perhaps even better <laughs> than therapy in the kind of sit down in the office with your, with your therapy, uh, therapist mode. So, uh, with, those, with those remarks, I'll say I've been reading your papers, I've been very much interested in them. I'm sorry I can't be there today, so I hope you have a uh, broad-ranging and deep conversation. Thank you.